she'll marry and support the rest of us. <laughs> I had a lot of fun with Aunt March today. How? Well, you see, Aunt March insisted on my reading that everlasting bell sham to her. So I groaned away as usual, knowing she'd soon go to sleep, and to sleep she went. As soon as her cat began to bob like a top-heavy dahlia, I whipped out the vicar of Wakefield from my pocket and read with one eye on him and the other on Aunt. I got to the part where they tumble in the water, forgot, and laughed out loud. This woke Aunt March, who insisted I read a bit of the frivolous stuff I prefer to the instructive bell sham. What? She frightened, scared to death. I read my very best, and she liked it, though she only said, I don't understand a word of it. Go back and read it, child. Good girl, Joe. Isn't that delightful, Amy? Full of incomprehensibilities. What happened then? Well, back I went and made the prim most interesting as ever I could. Once I was wicked enough to stop in a thrilling place and say, I'm afraid it tires you, ma'am. Shall I stop now? Oh, what did she say? Well, I'm frightened to hear. How exhilarating. She caught up the knitting needle that she had dropped from her hand, and with a sharp look through her specs said, Finish the chapter and don't be impertinent, miss. Well, did you like it? Did she? No. But she let old Belsham rest. And when I went back after my glove, there she was, so hard to bicker that she didn't see me laugh as I danced to Jim in the hall. What a pleasant life she might have. She only chose. I don't envy her much, in spite of her money. Rich people have as many worries as poor ones, I guess. Oh, that reminds me of something. I've got something to tell. It's not funny like Joe's story, but I've been thinking about it all day. Something to do with the key? Yes. Well, when I arrived this morning, everyone was in a flurry. And one of the girls said her older brother had done something terrible. His father had sent him away. Mrs. King was crying, and Mr. King was talking very loudly. How inexplicable. Oh, yes. Why did they ask any questions? With all that money, I felt sorry for them. I'm well, rather glad I had any wild brothers to do wicked things and disgrace our family. I think being disgraced in school is a great deal more trying than anything any poor little boy can do. Meaning what, Sir Oracle? Susie Perkins came to school today with a lovely red carnelian ring. Oh, I wanted it dreadfully bad, and I wish that was her with all my might. Well, she drew a picture of Mr. David with a mountain of crow bones, <laughs> and I hope on his back, and the words, Young ladies, my eyes are on you, coming out of his mouth in a bubble-like thing. We were all laughing over it, when all of a sudden, his eye was upon what us. What did you do? What did he say? Ordered her to bring him up the sleigh. Well, the poor child, whatever did she do? She was paralyzed with fright. But she went. There was nothing else she could do. And what do you think he did? Well, spit on the sleigh. No. To rub it out. He took her by the ear. The ear. Just fancy how horrid. And led her to the recitation platform, where he made her stand there for half an hour holding out the slate so everyone could see. Did the girls laugh after that? Not laugh, not one. They were all as still as mice. But Susie cried copious quartz. I'll bet you didn't envy her then. I felt millions and millions of carnelian rings when it made me happy after that. I would have never, ever got over that agonizing mortification. <laughs> I got something I like this morning. Not worth it, no. When I went to the fish shop to get some oysters, Mr. Lawrence was there. Or his grandfather, huh? He didn't see me. I hid behind the barrel. You're a barrel of trouble. While I was there, a poor woman came in with a pail and mop and asked Mr. Connor if she could do some scrubbing for a bit of fish because her children were hungry. Did Mr. Connor employ her or mm, disintegrate her? <laughs> well, he was in a hurry and said no. But Mr. Lawrence reached out and hooked up a fish with the crooked end of his cane and held it out to her saying, go along, woman, and cook it. She took the fish and hurried out of the shop without even having it wrapped. <laughs> oh, she did look so funny, hugging a big slippery fish. <laughs> hoping Mr. Lawrence would get his reward in heaven. We are a jolly fish. Joe, don't use such slang words. It's boyish. <laughs> That's why I do it. I detest unladylike girls. <laughs> I hate affected nitty panitty chits. Girls, you're both to blame. Joe, you're old enough to stop boyish tricks. 
It was all right when you were little, but you're grown up now. You pin your hair back. You need to remember you're a young lady. I am not. And if pinning my hair back makes me one, I'll wear it in two little tails until I'm 90. <laughs> I hate to be Miss March and look cramped. Bad enough being a girl anyway when I like boys' work, games, and manners. Oh, but Jill, your hair's so pretty. You're the finest in the family. Oh, I wish mine was as nice. I never could get over not being a boy. And it's worse now. <coughs> I'm dying to go and fight with Father, and I can only stay at home and knit like a pokey old woman. Oh, poor <coughs> Joe. It's too bad, but it can't be helped. So you must insist on making your name boyish and playing brother to us girls. As for you, Amy. <laughs> You're altogether too particular and prim. Oh, your errors are funny now, but you're going to grow up an affected old goose if you don't take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> I like your nice manners and refined way of speaking when you don't try to be elegant. Oh, your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. Uh, Joe's a tomboy and Amy a goose. What am I, please? <laughs> you're a deer and nothing else. Just our little mouse. Oh, what can be keeping Marnie so late? Oh, she should be home soon. You know, I was noticing her shoes are quite worn now. She I needs, thought she needs a new pair. I thought I'd buy her some of my dollar. No, I shall. I'm the oldest. I'm the man of the family now that father's away. <laughs> I'll buy the slippers. He told me to take special care of mother while he's gone. I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's get Mother something for Christmas and not buy anything for ourselves. That's just like you, Beth. What shall we get her? Well, I'll get a new pair of gloves. A pair of gray shoes. The best to be had. Handkerchiefs. All hands. I will get her a little bottle of voodoo torment. <laughs> she likes it. And it won't cost much. Then I will have somebody look over for my pencils. How will we give them the present? Well, put them on the table. Bring her in. And watch her open the bundles. You know, like we used to on our birthdays. Oh, it used to frighten me when it was my turn. Well, we need to go shopping tomorrow. Oh, you're right. There's so much to do about the play for Christmas night. And we must be doubly perfect, for Aunt March is coming to see how well we perform her brainchild. Her brainchild? Well, she did give me the plot from an old great story. But you wrote it. Oh, I hope you didn't tell her about the dress rehearsal today. I did, but there isn't the slightest chance of her coming. Her leg is giving her hail Columbia, and she's far too interested in the Vicar of Wakefield. <laughs> Amy, come to that fainting singer, stiff as a poker in that. I can't help it, and I don't choose to make myself all black and blue. If I can go down easily, I will flop. If I can't, I will sink into a chair and be graceful. Amy, just do it like this. Oh, Rodrigo, Rodrigo, save me! <laughs> oh, 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 Sure, you look tired to death. I'm all right. I have a surprise. Oh, I'm so tired. Hurry, Marmy. My dear wife and darling children, I know you will be pleased to hear that Mr. Lincoln has chosen Ulysses Grant to lead the Union cause. We are hoping this conflict between North and South, brothers and fathers, will soon be over. I have been extremely busy, and I'm so grateful for my duties as chaplain. As you are well aware, I'm too old to be drafted, and not young enough to be a soldier, but I'm doing my part, and I'm satisfied. Now for the best part of the letter. How are my little women? Give them my dear loving kiss. Tell them I think of them by day, and pray for them at night and find my best comfort in their affections at all times. A year seems like a long time to wait until I see them, but remind them that while we wait, we may all work, so that these hard days may not be wasted. I know they will remember all I said to them, that they will be loving children. To you will do their duties faithfully, fight their bosom enemies bravely, and conquer themselves so beautifully. 
that when I come back to them, I may be ever fonder and prouder of my little women. I am a selfish girl, but I will try, truly try to be better. So you will be disappointed in me. And I think too much of my looks. And I hate to work. But I don't want any more harm with that in public. I'll try to be what he calls me, a little woman. <laughs> Not a rough and wild. <laughs> and I will be all that Father hopes for when the year comes round. For we each have a better part to play in the scheme of things. Oh, girls. As I was sitting today, cutting out the blue flannel jackets for our soldiers, I started to think about Father and about how lonely and helpless we would be without him. I continued to worry until a man came into the store with an order for some clothes. He sat down beside me and we began to talk. He looked poor and tired and anxious. And what did you say to him? Have you any sons in the army, have you? Four. Two have been killed. One was a prisoner, and one was in a hospital in Washington. I told him he'd done a great deal for the country. <laughs> Not a mite more than I ought to, he replied. Go myself if I have any use. As I ain't, I give my sons, and I give them free. He spoke so cheerfully. He seemed so sincere and so glad to give it all that I was ashamed of myself. I'd given one man, one man, and thought it too much. He'd given four without begrudging me. I have all my daughters here to comfort me. And his last son is waiting in a hospital to say goodbye. Um, when I thought about my beautiful daughters, I felt so rich, so blessed, that I gave the man some money and thanked him heartily for the lesson he taught me. If you girls ever feel discontented, think of your blessings and be grateful. And I'm going to take that advice. You too. Well, my daughters, you promised me a dress rehearsal of the Christmas <laughs> Look, Marmy, the stage is all set. Oh, good. Are you all prepared? Oh, we'll be ready in five minutes. Won't you come in? Young Mr. Lawrence is here, oh. and he's brought a friend. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Watch. I'd like you to meet my tutor, Mr. John Brooke. Yes, Lori insisted that we come see the rehearsal tonight. Uh, Joe said they would start a little after you came home. And, and we watched for your coming the past hour or so. Well, I was detained, <laughs> but the girls have retired to prepare for the performance. Let's sit here and we'll be the audience. I've had the great pleasure of meeting your daughters, and I feel my introduction to you is indeed an honor, Mrs. Marsh. How so, Mr. Brooks? You are the sort of mother I've always wished to have. Do go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, my mother died when I was a baby, and my dream of a mother is what your daughters express in every action in reference to you. Well, they are dear girls. Joe is the nicest. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm afraid my dream is Are you ready, Marley? The entire audience is seated. Peanuts! Popcorn! Get a program of the play! Is that you, Lori? Yes! And Mr. Brooke is here! And Mr. Brooke is here!
spirits do not linger long. Ah, Hagar, hast thou brewed the potion that will free me from this dastard Rodrigo? I'm encanting the spirits now. Dispatch with speed, for my revenge must be appeased. Why is your hatred so great for this Rodrigo? He is my rival for the hand of Zira, who dwells in yon castle. I demand from you a potion to destroy Rodrigo, and another to make Zira adore me. Again? I'm encanting the spirits to bring me the potion. Henri, Henri, Henri. Hither I come from beyond the sun, hence from the silver moon. Take this magic spell and use it well, for its power will vanish soon. Is this the distillment that will bring me happiness and revenge? Surely it is, most honored you, though. <laughs> then, Potion, do thy dirty work. Rodrigo, thy doom is sealed, and Zero will soon be mine. Oh, 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 oh. Did thou bring the potion I demanded? Surely I did. <laughs> Why does everyone take <laughs> <laughs> to bring revenge upon his revenge? How is this possible? That friend of a villain has killed several of my people. Who knows to him? Oh, down this belt, no. If he knew he'd not come to me seeking aid, how will you avenge? I mean, how wilt thou avenge? I shall thwart his plans and be avenged upon him. <laughs> come, O oh power of evil, come at thy work and have it done. In the snow or in the rain, bring to Hugo every pain. Find up the goods and the worst. May my revenge be accursed. That was excellent! Meg is indeed a good actress. Well, I think she could make a living at it. Well, no one ever actually gets a living out of acting. The best they ever get is an existence. <laughs> well, what I hear is you're right. The glitter in life can be very alluring, but seldom remunerative. It wasn't Joe just wonderful. Oh, oh dear. She has the spark of genius. Oh, I don't mean her acting. I mean her writing. Uh, did she write the play? My yes. Every Christmas she writes another and more interesting one. Why can't you see the finale? <coughs> ah, Zira, full many a time hath the moon in its orb swung round the sun since first our love was plighted. It seems but yesterday eve we met. Jupiter was blowing in the north. North heavens! And to the south, Orion was wending its lonely way. Oh, woe is me to be loved of two men, and my choice not to my honorable father. Mayhap we can win him to our side. I fear tis useless. Our cause is dark. Tis always darkest ere the dawn breaks upon the world. Me father, me thinkest me hear me father. Daughter, what art thou doing? Do not enter, sire. I am retiring. My maid hath removed my gown. Sleep dwell upon thine eyes, and love in thine heart. For the man of my choice is the Honorable Hugo. Good night, father. Didst hear? I betroll to Sir Hugo. Oh, woe is me. There is but one solution, my love. What is it? Flight. Oh, whence? <laughs> to my baronial estates in the vastness of the Black Forest. Where dwells the dragon? No longer does he abide the locality. What meanest thou? I slew him yester-eve. <laughs> Out of the forest came he, demanding the blood of a nobleman. I mounted my trusty black horse of Helenon. Fire flew from the monster's mouth, and the gleam in his eyes was like twin suns in their brilliance. He mocked and reared at my approach. He stood to his back limbs, and he rose to the height of a mountain. Then he sprang. <clears throat> a Pelinon who was a quick-witted charger has stood with me many times in the combat with evil. The monster was not to be able to do anything. Thought he sprang one side and in a flash. My trusty Damascus blade had entered the heart of the beast. <laughs> Pelinon, knowing the death agony could bring to both man and horse, took to his heels. The beast lashed left and right, left and right, uprooting trees and leveling hills with each slash of his tail. And it wasn't until sundown that the agonies did cease, and the beast lay cold in death. My hero, my Rodrigo. Oh, here, my darling, let me help you down from your chamber. I come with you in great dispatch. Oh, 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 Sorry, Amy, please forgive me. Well? 
It was my fault. <coughs> That's the way all sisterly arguments should end. I'm proud of your attitude, Amy. <coughs> At last, someone is developing a level head in this topsy turvy house. <laughs> and March, uh, I didn't know you were here. When did you ever appreciate my being anywhere? <laughs> did you see the play at March? I did all this, and I, I suggest more rehearsal if you intend to leave it on Christmas Eve. It is a deplorable state of imperfection. And March, this is young Mr. Lawrence. How are you, young man? <laughs> My tutor, Mr. Brooke. <laughs> Did you say look? Uh, that's Brooke. Demanding as the ego, and more tender and loving as what ego. Suit your actions to your words, and you may be believable as both characters. Men, don't put so much character into your voice as to you the witch. Amy, oh. use your gestures. <laughs> And talk like human beings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You must study go go. You don't know what you're talking about. How does it all end, Meg? This young lady's name is Margaret, Mr. Book. Marnie, shall we proceed? <laughs> yes, do. I want to see the finish, Joe. Miss Josephine. <laughs> I only know how it ends. The father interferes with the flight. The villain tries to get the hero to drink with him. The witch has switched drinks, so when you go drink so that that being is still moot, he dies. The oh. then asks for the hand of Zira. The father informs him that he is too poor to offer a dowry. Rodrigo claps his hands. A page enters with bags of gold. The bags are open, the coins fall on the floor, Zira is given to her lover, and all ends well. But, but how will you manage the drinking scene when Miss Josephine plays both Hugo and Rodrigo? I play Rodrigo in that part. You girls are too versatile. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marvie, I see someone coming to the door. I'll get thank you. Oh, permit me to accompany you, May, Miss March. The door is ajar. I don't know why they just don't walk in. <laughs> you are just scrumptious, Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Marmy. I can't hear. The telegram. Lori, get her some water. I'll get it. Read it out loud, Marmy. Your husband is very ill. Come at once. Oh, Daddy! My poor Daddy! I must find the means to go to Washington. I'll see what I can do. Oh, Lori, wait for me. If you don't think I'm intruding, I'll accompany you to Washington. I couldn't ask you to do that, oh, sir. It'll be no problem. I'll have Mr. Lawrence commission me to go. Oh, maybe he'll listen to my pleading on your behalf. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Girls, are you strong enough <laughs> to get my trunk? Oh, yes, my So that's young Mr. Lawrence, eh? I'd have known he'd inherit the wild, harem scarum ways of that mother of his. Well, for <laughs> sure. He did blame his father for sending him away from home under the circumstances. What's in that, that telegram? Here, read it. Where are my spectacles? Do you ever lose yours? I don't have to wear them yet. Don't flaunt your age in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> You're no younger than I. How old are you? Have you found them yet? What an answer to my question! Oh, this is referring to your spectacles. Why don't you say what you mean? Oh, oh, oh I have them on. <laughs> Wait. If you couldn't see that, I suggest you get a pair as soon as possible. <laughs> Just read the telegram, please. Just as I said, no brains in his head. Your husband, my brother, going off to war at his age. The governor will pay him because he's too old and too sick to be a soldier, but he goes without pay to minister the gospel to the sick and dying. A noble sacrifice. And he sacrifices his health. I sacrifice that. There's no money a bond to go to. We haven't asked you for any money, have I? No, but you'll need it, won't you? Yes. And why refuse mine? <laughs> <laughs> because you haven't offered. 
so, but I do. He's my own flesh and blood, and, and sick among strangers. Who else should give for his comforts? How much did he? Well, I don't interrupt. <laughs> I have no money with me. Stop on your way to the station and I'll give you what is necessary. Oh, you better hurry. Oh, there's a train in about a half an hour. That is if my watch is correct. Oh, Amy! <laughs> how are you advancing in your drawing? Uh, why, I... Don't answer your elders, young lady. I know. <laughs> I had a talk with Mr. Davis. And he thinks you have great talent. <coughs> He's working hard and progressing. <coughs> And I promise to send you to Europe when you're ready. Thank you. Oh, by the way, have you read the Vicar of Wakefield? <laughs> you should. It's a great book. <laughs> Poor dear soul. Do you see what it means to live alone, my daughters? <laughs> Take your mother's advice. Find yourselves a worthy man. Make good homes. Get something more out of life than selfishness. <coughs> Beth, will you get my handbag, please? Oh, yes, Mommy. Grandfather sent these for Mr. March. Thank you. The two of you put them in the trunk, and I'll go get the rest of my things to pack. Here, take the wine bottles, Amy, but don't let them fall. Hold on to them. They're 50 years old. Isn't that why they're so slippery? I think so. Now, Grandpa said to take the blanket and put it on the bottom like this. And then put the wine bottles in the middle. So they won't break. Lori, you're holding my hand. <laughs> it's a nice hand to hold. <laughs> you really think so? The softest I've ever held in my life. So you've held hands before. <laughs> yes, Joe. But hers are like a boy. <laughs> Joe always wanted to be a boy. But I think a girl should be a girl. But then she's preparing her life for marriage and motherhood. I agree. Uh, Grandpa said this wine was for Mr. Martin. He began to uh, convalesce. <coughs> that last word's his. It's too big for me. Oh, well, that's a simple word. What does it mean? You would understand. <laughs> How do you know I would? Well, what is it? That's what I'm asking you. Um, Mother, you will have to tell him. To convalesce means to get well slowly. <coughs> Here we are, Marnie. And we've got great news. We stopped to ask your grandfather to, to commission me to accompany your mother to Washington. I'm to have leave for two months. Great. Are the horses all hitched up? Mm -hmm. They're outside. Are you finished packing yet, Mrs. Marsh? Yes, I am. Lend a hand here, Brooke, and we'll carry this out to the carriage. Girls, will you get my bonnet? Sit down. Thank you, dear. Here, Marty. It's my contribution to making Father comfortable and then bringing him home. My dear, where did you get this money? It's $25. Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. No, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it, and I don't think you'll blame me for I only sold what was my own. Oh, you're here. Oh, your beautiful hair. My dear, there was no need of this. She doesn't look like my Joe anymore, but I love her for it. You're one beauty, Joe! Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was wild to do something for Father. Meg gave her quarterly salary toward the rent, and I bought new clothes of mine, and I felt wicked. Oh, I had no idea of selling my hair first. But as I walked along, I saw a sign in the barbershop window, and it came to me. Suddenly, I had something to make money out of. So I walked in and asked if he'd buy my hair. Oh, I don't see how you even dare to do it. The barber stared at first. He wasn't used to having girls come in and ask if he could buy their hair. Oh, he said mine wasn't a fashionable shade anyway. But when I told him why I wanted to sell it, 
He changed his mind and said he was assistant to the blind Oh, Joe, didn't you feel terrible when that first cut came? I took one look at my hair as the man got up the shears, and that was the end of it. Oh, I felt sick to my stomach when I saw my hair on that table. Oh, my dear. Your father would be so proud of your sacrifice for him. <coughs> Meg, I want you to be the mother while I'm gone. <coughs> now, I don't want you girls to fret or be idle. Go about your work as usual. Work can be a blessed solace. Hope and pray, my girl. And remember that whatever happens, it's God's will. Goodbye, my little one. something by then to be proud of. I'm such a lazy dog, though. <laughs> <laughs> I shall just dawdle, Joe. Lori, Mother says you need motivation. And once you get it, she's sure you'll do splendidly. Oh, you should do as your grandfather wishes. 
Don't be idle and fret, but do your duty. You'll get your reward in the end as good as Mr. Brooke has. By being respected and loved. What do you know about him? <laughs> only what your grandfather's told me. Oh! But he refused to go to Europe and cared for his sister until she died. Oh, I see. Well, it is like grandfather to find out all about him. If I ever get my wish, you'll see what I'll do for Brooke. Well, you can start now by not plaguing the life out of him. How do you know I do? Well, <laughs> I see his face when he leaves your house. Oh. If you've been good, he walks briskly and he looks pleased. Is that so? And if you've plagued him, he looks sober and dejected. So, <laughs> you keep a, a, an eye of the good and bad marks on making most face to you. Well, I see him <laughs> smile and bow as he passes your window. But I didn't know you'd got the telegraph. Girls! Girls! Amy, my sweetheart. And last but not least, my little mouse. Oh, oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> How did you stand the trip, Mr. Brooks? Oh, it, it went splendidly. And you know, your father, he was a brave soldier oh. the whole way. Oh, I know you must have a million things to say to each other, so I'll take Lori and go. Well, how are you, my boy? I didn't see you standing there. I can't blame you with such wonderful daughters to greet you. I'll see you soon, sir, and hope your health returns. Oh. Isn't it wonderful to have them home? Seems an age since you went away. That's been a pretty long road. But we've got you back. We're about to put hard times behind us. Mm. I remember when this hand was soft and smooth, and your very first care was to keep it so. It was very pretty then. But to me, it is much prettier now. For in these seeming blemishes, I read a little history. Burnt offerings have been made to vanity. <laughs> this hardened palm has earned better than blisters. I'm sure the sewing done with these prick fingers will last a long time. So much goodwill went into the stitches. I'm glad to hold this good, industrious hand and hope I shall not soon be asked to give it away. Hmm? <laughs> well, in spite of the cropped head, I don't see the son, Joe, whom I left a year ago. I see a young lady who pins her collar straight and raises her boots neatly. Her face has grown thin and pale from waiting and anxiety, but I like to look at it, for it has grown gentle. I know I shall Miss my wild girl, but I've got a strong, tender-hearted woman in her place. I don't know if the shearing has sobered our black sheep, but I do know that in all Washington I could not find anything beautiful enough to be bought with the five and twenty dollars which my good girl sent to me. Thank you, Father. I'm trying to be your son, but I feel like crying. Now that Father... Well, there's so little of her, I'm afraid to say much for fear she'll slip away altogether. Well, she's not so shy as she used to be. I've got you safe now, my dad, and I'll keep you so that way. So glad you've come home. Amy, last but not least, I'm so pleased you're content to be last. As you grow older, you'll learn to mold your character as you do your little play models. And I'd be infinitely prouder of a lovable daughter with a talent for making life beautiful to herself and those around her than a, a great artist. Well, girls, I think it's time we let Father and Beth get to their rooms. That might be a good idea, Mother. Come on, little mouse. Let's see if we can navigate those stairs together. Marnie, I'm so glad you're back. I'm worried about something. Meg, how quickly you guessed. What is it, dear? Well, it's a little thing, but it fidgets me. Oh, sit right down here on the couch and tell Mother everything. Well, last summer, Meg left a pair of gloves at the Lawrence's, and only one was returned. We forgot about it until Lori found out that Mr. Brooke had it. He kept it in his waistcoat pocket. And one time it fell out and Laurie joked him about it. 
and he admitted that he liked Meg. Oh, he didn't dare tell her, you know, she's so young and he's so poor. Oh, isn't that a dreadful state of things? Do you think Meg cares for him? <laughs> oh, no. Well, I don't know anything about love and such nonsense. When the novels girls show up, I stare at her blushing, fainting away and acting like fools. Meg does nothing of the sort. She eats and drinks and sleeps like a sensible creature. She can even look me straight in the eye when I talk about that man, and only blushes a little when Laura jokes about lovers. Then you fancy Meg does not care for John? Who? Mr. Brook. I call him John now. We kind of fell into it at the hospital. Mommy, I know you'll take his part. Well, he's been good to father, and you won't send him away, but let Meg marry him if she wants to. Oh, what a mean thing to play up to Papa and to be nice to you to trick you into liking him. Oh, don't. don't be angry, dear. John was so devoted to Father at the hospital that we couldn't help but be fond of him. He was very open and honorable about Meg. He told us that he loved her, but that he would earn a comfortable home before asking her to marry him. Well, that's just like him. <laughs> he only wanted our baby to love her and to work for her. He meant her to love him if she could. But I would not consent to Meg's engaging herself so young. Of course not. It would be idiotic. Oh, I knew there was mischief brewing. I felt it. But it's worse than I imagined. Oh, I wish I could marry Meg and keep her safe in the family. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you these things in confidence. And I don't want you to tell Meg. When I see them together, I can be a better judge of how she feels about him. But she'll see him in those handsome eyes she talks about, and it will be all over. Oh, she has such a soft heart, it will melt like butter in the sun if he looks at her sentimentally. <coughs> Aren't you overdoing this just a little? She likes blue eyes and thinks John a lovely name. She'll go and fall in love, and that will be the end of peace and fun and cozy times together. Not the end, dear Joe. I can see it all now. They'll go lovering around the house, and we'll all have to dodge. I will be absorbed and no good to me anymore. Mr. Brooke will scratch up a fortune somewhere, carry Meg off and leave a hole in the family. You don't like it either, Barney. Oh, I'm glad. Let's send Mr. Brooke away and not tell Meg a word of it, but be happy as we've always been. Um, I did wrong to sigh, Joe. It's only natural that you girls want good homes by and by. But I want my girls as long as I can keep them. If Meg loves John, they can wait and test that love in the way. But wouldn't you rather she marry a rich man? Money is a, is a good and useful thing. And I hope my girls are never in need of it too bitterly or are tempted by it too much. I know how much genuine satisfaction can be had in a plain little home where the daily bread is earned and a few hardships sweeten a few pleasures. But I'm disappointed in May. Oh, I'd plan to have her marry Laurie and live in the lap of luxury. I'm afraid Laurie is hardly grown up enough for me. But make plans, Joe. Let time and their hearts make your friends. But I hate seeing things all snarl up and crisscross. When a cut here or a snip there would straighten it all out. I was wearing flat irons on our heads would keep us from growing up. <laughs> Mommy, yes, dear. Father's calling for you. Thank you, Meg. Joe, come to the window. Hurry, come see Laurie. Oh, what's he doing? Pulling at his hair and beating his chest like that. Showing how your John will go on by and by. Touching, isn't it? But don't say my John. Is it proper or true? Don't tease me, Joe. I told you I don't care for him. <laughs> there isn't anything to be said. Let's all just be friends as we were. I see through you, Meg. You're not at all yourself, and you seem far away from me. I don't need to plague you, and I will bear it like a man. And I do wish it was all filled. I need to wait. So if you mean to do it, make haste and get it over with. Hey, Joe. I can't say or do anything until he speaks. <laughs> if he did speak, you wouldn't know what to say. You'd cry or blush and let him have his own way instead of giving him a good, decisive nod. I'm not so silly as you think. 
I know just what I'll take. I've planned it all. I'm not going to be taken unaware, Joe. I'm prepared. Would you mind telling me what you'd say to him? <coughs> no. No, certainly not. You're old enough now to be my confidant. And my experience might be useful to you in the future. Maybe in your own affairs. Well, I don't mean to have any. It's fun to watch other people philander, but I should feel like a fool doing it myself. <laughs> oh, I think not. Not if you like someone and he really likes you. We're not talking about me. What would you say to John? Well, I'm going to say quite calmly and decisively. Oh, thank you, Mr. Brooke. But let us be friends as we were. That's difficult enough. But I don't believe he'll ever say it. And he won't be satisfied if you do. He goes on like the rejected lovers in the book. She'll give in to him rather than her. It's not. I'm going to tell him I've made up my mind. And I'm going to walk out of the room with dignity. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. I came for my umbrella. Uh, that is to, s to see if your father's resting easily. I'll go ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, Mr. Brooke. I'll call Mother. Oh, don't go. <laughs> Are you afraid of me, Margaret? No. <laughs> well, why would I be afraid of you? You've been so kind to Father. I wish I could thank you. Should I tell you how? No. I won't tell you. No. I only want to know if you care for me a little bit. No. I love you so much, you. I don't know. Well, will you try and find out? I want to know so much. I can't go to work with any heart until I learn whether I'm to have my reward in the end or not. You're too young. But I'll wait. And in the meantime, you could be learning to like me. Would it be such a tough lesson? Dear? <laughs> Dear? Choose to learn it, Meg. Oh, I don't choose. Go away and let me be. Do you really mean that? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I don't want to be bothered by such things. Well, I hope you'll change your mind. In the meantime, I'll wait and say nothing until you've had more time. Dear me! <laughs> 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 well, that's evident. But what's father's friends say to make you look like a blushing rose? <laughs> There's a going on, and I insist on knowing what it is. <laughs> We're merely talking. Mr. Brooke came by to get his umbrella. Uh, yes, it's out there. Don't accept it, child. I hear you. I'll call mother. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have something to say to you, and I must free my mind at once. You don't intend to marry this crook, do you? Crook. Because if you do, not one penny of my money goes to you. Remember that. And be a sensible girl. I'll marry who I choose, Aunt March. <laughs> and you can leave your money to anyone you like. Heidi, tighty. <laughs> so that's the way you take my advice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, by and by. Just you wait till you try love in a cottage and, and found it a failure. Oh, it's better than some people find in a mansion. <gasps> <laughs> now, Meg, dear, be reasonable and take my advice. I mean it kindly and don't want you to ruin your whole life by making a mistake in the beginning. You ought to marry well and help your family. It's your duty to make a rich match. And, and it ought to be impressed on you. Mother and father don't think so. They like John, even though he's poor. Poor parents, young lady. No more worldly wisdom. True baby. I'm glad. This rook. Crook. He's poor. Does he have any rich relatives? <laughs> no, but he's got so many friends. They can't live on friends. Try it and see how cool they'll grow. <laughs> Do they have any business? Not yet. 
But Laurie's grandfather's going to... Well, that won't last long. James Lawrence is a crotchety old fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Some people can gain by being cross with the world. It's quite beyond me. <laughs> can't be depended upon. People who lose their tempers never can. <laughs> we never see our own virtues, Aunt March. You're right. <laughs> so you can marry a man without money, position, or business, and go on working harder than you do now, when you could be comfortable all the days of your life by minding me and doing better. I thought you had more sense, Meg. I couldn't do better if I waited half my life. <coughs> John is good. He's kind. He's got heaps of talent. He's going to work and get on. Oh, he's majestic and brave. Childish pride. Everyone likes and respects him. Since when are you everyone? I'm proud to think he'd care for me. Even though I am poor and young and silly. He knows you have rich relatives, child. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret of his liking, I suspect. How dare you say such a thing, Aunt March? John is above such meanness. Oh, I won't listen to you a moment longer if you say so. Liberty Church! <laughs> My John wouldn't marry for money any sooner than I would. We're willing to wait, we're going to work. Well, I'm not afraid of being poor, I've been happy so far. And I know I will be with John because he loves me. And I, I wash my hands of this whole affair. You're a willful child. And you've lost more than you know by this piece of fun. Stay and see, Father. No, I won't. I'm disappointed in you. And I haven't the spirits to see your father now. He'll be disappointed. What's his disappointment? To mine. <laughs> Don't ask for any money after you're married. Your Mr. Brooks friend, not the friends, will have to support you. I'm done with you forever. <laughs> I couldn't help hearing that. <laughs> Thanks for defending me. And Aunt Marge. <laughs> For proving you do care for me a little bit. I didn't know how much until she said those terrible things about you. So I needn't go, but may stay? Yep, John. Mm. What is this, I say? That's exactly what you say. Congratulations. Oh. You're the first to encourage us, sir. You'll make the best couple in the land. <laughs> I knew that Brooke would get his way. But I didn't. You always do. You, I would have failed but for Aunt March. You mean she agrees? She didn't exactly agree. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> well, I had prearranged to reject John. And did. And what was your plan? Well, to say thank you, Mr. Brooke, and fly out of the room. So what did you do instead when he proposed? Well, I said yes, John, and I flew into his arms. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. March, at last, the sun has come into your home. Well, I suspected it, but not quite so soon. <laughs> <laughs> Mother! Son! <laughs> Father, he'll be so pleased. Did you tell him? You told him no? No, I told him yes. <laughs> Get off! <laughs> I don't approve of the match. But I'll make up my mind to bear it, so I'll not say a word against it. Lori, you can't know how hard it is for me to give up Meg. You don't give her up. You only go half. But it can never be the same again. I've lost my dearest friend. You've got me anyway. I'm not good for much, but I'll stand by you, Joe, all the days of my life. Upon my word, I will. I know you will, and I am much obliged. You are a great comfort to me. It's because I love you, Joe. Oh, no! <laughs> you will, and you must hear me. It's no use, Joe. We've got to have it out. And the sooner the better for both of us. Say what you will, then I'll listen. <laughs> I've loved you ever since I've known you, Joe. 
I couldn't help it. You've been so good to me. I tried to show you, but you wouldn't let me. Now I'm going to make you hear me and give me an answer, for I can't go on any longer. I want to save you. This I thought you'd understand. I know you did, but girls are so peculiar. <laughs> you never know what they mean. Say no and they mean yes. Drive a man out of his wits just for fun of it. I don't. I never wanted to make you care for me. I hoped you'd love me, though I'm not half good enough. Oh, Lori, yes you are. You're a great deal too good for me. I am so grateful to you and so proud and fond of you. I don't know why I can't love you the way you want me to. I've tried, but I can't change the feeling. It would be a lie to say that I do when I don't. Really? Truly, Joe? I don't believe it's the right sort of love. Lori, I want to tell you something. Don't tell me that. I can't bear to know. Know what? <laughs> that you love another man? I have the least idea of loving anybody else. But you will sooner or later. And then what will become of me? You'll love someone else too, like a sensible boy and forget about it. Oh, them. I can't love anyone else and I'll never forget you, Joe. Lori, you haven't heard what I wanted to tell you. Now please sit down and listen. I want to do the right thing and make you happy. Go on. Well, I agree with Marnie that you and I are not suited to one another. Of our quick tempers and strong wills would probably make us miserable if we were so foolish as to... Mary, no. If you love me, Joe, I should be a perfect saint. You could make me anything you like. No, I can't. <laughs> I've tried it and I've failed, and I won't risk our happiness on such a serious experiment. We never agree. So we'll go on being good friends all our lives and not do anything rash. Yes, we will if we get a chance. Lori, be reasonable. I won't be reasonable. And I don't want to take what you call a sensible view. It won't help me, and it only makes me sore. I don't believe you've got any heart. I wish I hadn't. Don't disappoint us, Joe. Everyone expects it. Grandpa has his heart set upon it. Your family likes it. And I can't go on without you. So, say you will. And let's be happy. Do. Do. I can't say yes truly, so I won't say it at all. Oh, you'll see that I'm right, and you'll thank me. I'll be hanged if I do. Oh, yes, you will see that I'm right. Lori, you will meet a lovely, accomplished girl who will adore you and make a fine mistress for your fine home. I wouldn't. I'm awkward and odd, and you'd be ashamed of me. And I shouldn't like elegant society, and you would. And you'd hate my scribbling, and I couldn't get along without it. And we'd be unhappy and wish we hadn't done it, and everything would be fine. Anything else? Nothing else. <laughs> Except that I don't believe I shall ever marry. I'm happy in my own. I know better. The day will come when you shall care for someone. And you'll love him tremendously. And you'll live and die for him. I know you will. It's your way. And I shall have to stand by and see it. Lori, I shall always be fond of you. Very fond of you. As a friend. But I shall never marry you, and the sooner you believe it, the better for both of us. You'll be sorry, Joe! Well, where are you going? To the devil! <laughs> <laughs> Did she threaten to cut Meg off? Oh, it's an ill wind. Meaning what? 
Well, very soon I am leaving for Rome to study painting. Oh, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Doubly so. How? Well, Mr. Lawrence informed Anne March he's sending Laurie to Europe next month. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? You'll see a great deal of each other. You won't care? No. Oh, Joe, I have a confession to make. A confession regarding what? Laurie told me that he loved you more than me, and I did a terrible thing, Joe. I ran to the attic to your desk, took your novel, and tore his shreds and threw the fire. What? <laughs> My novel that I was so fond of and worked so hard on? Have you really burnt it? I did, but I did. You wicked, wicked girl! I shall never forget you! I shall never be able to write it again! Joe? Joe, what's the meaning of this? Sorry, Marnie, it's my dreadful temper. I try to curb, but I think I have. And then it breaks out worse than ever. What shall I do? Watch your pray, dear Joe. You never stop crying. And never think it's impossible to conquer your fault. Now, get out of the way and leave us alone. We know how to navigate, don't we, little mouse? Yes, Father. Now you sit right down there and you tell me all about yourself since I went away. Well, Father dear, there's really not much to tell. <coughs> I'm upset that Joe and Amy and Ben have been such devoted, attentive sisters. But even though I wasn't certain of some of the events of those dark days, I felt their loving presence constantly with me. And when they told me of your return, I fully determined to get well. We'll get strong and healthy together. We'll make a race of it. What do you say? Very well, my beloved father. And I will hold firm to your teaching. And the race will end at dead feet. What does that mean? Under the wire, even Stephen. What is the city of Washington like, father? Oh, it's the dream of dreams. The most beautiful place man has yet conceived. But at present, it's uh, under a fall of sorrow. And New York, father. Too massive for comprehension. I'm going there. Really? Yes, I have written to Mrs. Kirk applying for the position as tutor to her children. Joe, you didn't. Did she answer? Yes. And she replied saying I could have the nights to myself, to write to my heart's content. You won't be leaving us for some time, I hope. If you object, I won't go at all. Well, we'll see. Beth, are you comfortable? Yes, and so much better since you arrived. Oh, maybe it's the postman. I'll get it. <coughs> I did! I did! I love the check! Oh, oh, what does that mean? <laughs> that I won the prize. We've got to go to the seashore as the doctor ordered. Oh, no, I couldn't do it, dear. It would be selfish. But you shall go. That's why I tried, and that's what I, why I succeeded. Won't it be wonderful to see her strong and rosy again? Oh, good for Dr. Joe, who always cures her patients. <laughs> the check is from the Daily Eagle. See, the rival painters by Miss Josephine March. First prize in the contest, $100. Oh, Joe, I'm so excited. Tell me about it. Well, not long ago, I sat beside a boy who had a copy of The Daily Eagle. He was interested in a story by Mrs. Northberry. That prolific writer, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, he said she makes quite a good living out of her stories. When I said that I could do as well, he said, go ahead. So this gave me an idea, and I took the rival pairs to his office. Oh, weren't you frightened? It took me three tries before I finally got up the stairs. Why, well, my dear? Well, there was a dentist's office with this, and at the entrance it had a sign with a pair of artificial jaws that slowly opened and shut. <laughs> 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 oh, hurrah for Dr. Joe. That, that laugh was the best medicine I've taken in weeks. Well, I took my story to Mr. Davis, and this is the first I've heard. And a worthwhile reply. It's lucrative and surprising. Well, tell us, what is the story? Oh, your usual labyrinth of mystery, murder, and love. At the end of the story, half of the ensemble is dead, and the other half is happily ever after. No. <laughs> you can do better than this. You aim for the highest in life. Never mind the money. I'll make a compromise of the two. Mm. I feel like strolling the grounds now, Mother. Care to come along, Beth? Oh, no, thank you. I think I'm comfortable here. If I get strong and healthy through my walks, it'll be your loss. Let's bundle you up, Father. We won't be long, girl. Yeah, just a breath of fresh air. Why don't you want to go to the seashore, Beth? Oh, I fear to be so far away from home. Fear? 
Oh, Joe, try to understand it. And don't be troubled about me, because it's best. Indeed it is. Is this why you were so happy when you learned mother and father were returning? Oh, did you feel it then and keep it to yourself? Yes, I gave up hoping then. Although when I saw you all so well and strong, and full of happy plans for their return, I knew I could never... Beth, and you didn't tell me? Oh, why did you shut me out? Well, I wasn't sure. I hoped I was mistaken. I didn't want to frighten all of you. It would have been selfish of me. At least I thought so then. You were so happy with Lori. He's fond of you too, Beth. Oh, he's so good to me. Oh, I love him like a brother. You are all so dear and loving, but I hate to leave you. I try every day to get better. I want you oh so much. I'm full of hope in the morning. But each evening I lose a little, and I feel I shall never get it back. Oh, life is like the time, Joe. It struggles to get to the flow, enjoys its brief moment of achievement, but when it turns, it goes slowly, and it can't be stopped. But it shall be stopped. Your tide shall not turn so soon. Oh, Beth, I can't let you go. I will work and pray and fight against it. There must be a way. It can't be too late. Oh, it's hard to stay on ground to go. Well, life is very sweet to me. Oh, Joe, you'll tell the others, won't you? Meg has John to comfort her, and Lori will comfort Amy. But you must stand by father and mother. Oh, if I can, Beth. But I am going to believe it is a sick fancy and not let you think it's true. <coughs> I have a feeling it was never intended that I should live long. Beth, please! Oh, Joe, I'm not like the rest of you. I never made any plans about what I'd like to do when I grew up. I never thought about being married like you all did. And I never wanted to go away. And the hard part now will be leaving you all. I'm not afraid. But it seems this God will be homesick for you, even in heaven. Then make up your mind not to leave us. Oh, Beth, I'll have you strong and rosy by spring. Then think of the race with Father. Oh, Joe, dear, don't hope anymore. It won't do any good. Now help me to my room. Oh, Joe, we've had happy times together, haven't we? Yes, yes. <laughs> Would you know what else, Joe? What, dear? I think the tide will go easily. to his grandfather's. I think we're alone. Good. What is it, dear? It's John. What's he been doing? I don't know how to tell you, Marty. My dear, forget you're married. Become like a little girl again and tell Marty your troubles. Oh, Marty, I'm contemplating divorce. Mm -hmm. My dear, <clears throat> that involves scandal. I don't care if it does. <coughs> Sit right down here. You tell me everything and you start from the beginning. Oh, John's away all day, even at night when I want to see him. It's not fair that I should have the hardest work and never any fun. Oh, men are so selfish. They've been very best. Women can be too. Well, yes, but it can't be right for him to neglect me. Don't you neglect him? 
I do, dear, as far as sympathy goes. <coughs> but I think the fault is yours, Meg. I don't see how. Didn't you used to spend evenings exclusively with John before the twins were born? Oh, yes, but that's before I had two babies to tell. You're only making the same mistake that most young mothers make. Don't neglect your husband for your babies. Don't shut him out of the nursery. Teach him how to help in it. The children need him. Help him understand that he has a part to do. Oh, how do I do this? Take an interest in whatever John likes. Let him read to me. Talk to him. Share ideas. Don't shut yourself up because you're a woman. Learn about the world and educate yourself. Oh, Marty, does this mean I need to talk to him about business and, and society and politics? Yes, dear. <laughs> Try it and see if he doesn't prefer your company. This is the time when the two of you should be growing together. That first tenderness will soon wear off unless care is taken to preserve it. And there is no time as precious and special to parents as those first few years of those little lives given to us to train. I'll get it. Oh, how paternal you look. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have heard him a few minutes ago. No, no, not that, Mother. A, a pin stuck Daisy and she began to scream. And then Demi, Demi gets angry, tries to show her that he can scream her down. Like Grandma Tate. Oh, be careful. Don't break them, Mother. <laughs> I was tending babies before you were born. Yes, but not twins. Let Grandma take you, not the babies. <laughs> <laughs> I've decided to give the children less of my time and more to you. You're not ill, are you, Meg? <laughs> <laughs> Whom do you think is the best man for our next president? <laughs> Am I hearing you right? Did you say, whom will be the best man for president? Yes, I think we should run Mr. Lincoln again. Of course, James and Ken's a bit too old to be put up, don't you think? Are you sure you're all right? <laughs> yes, Lincoln and Jackson is our best ticket. That's Johnson, not Jackson, dear. Oh, John. Vice President's names don't matter. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm not just my mind, I'm not my man. But just open my heart to mother. Oh, I see. So she's the one that advised you to ask a lot of silly questions? No. She told me I need to take more of an interest in the subjects you like best. <coughs> I know nothing about world politics. If you promise to teach me, I promise to learn. <laughs> the ending of a happy story, or what? Oh, Joe. <laughs> oh, it's so nice of you to come to the army on a birthday. I, I hear your train play. A cow got on the track and was stuck there for a full hour. <laughs> Every passenger tried to tend it, and Mrs. Cow was planted there for good. Well, so how did you get it off the track? Oh, I gave my famous imitation of a cow. It either aroused her maternal instincts or frightened her in the movie. <laughs> so so the came right in the movie. Oh, Joe, you have become a great writer. I'm afraid so. Why not? <laughs> they say all writers are absent minded. Can you imagine me buying Mommy a present and rushing off without it? Have you told her? Oh, no. I missed it just as we were out of the station. I sent a letter to my neighbor, Professor Bear, to post it immediately. If he doesn't also forget, I should have it before nightfall. Well, the New York train just arrived a few minutes ago. I'll run down and see if it's right. Oh, no. There's plenty of time. A walk after lunch would do us some good. Yeah. Amy! Amy. <laughs> what a oh. lovely gown! <laughs> Joe! Lori! <laughs> you have grown a mustache! How becoming! <laughs> <laughs> What's this? A, a misplaced eyebrow! Who <laughs> said that first? Who? Aaron told it to Moses. Oh, get out! It was an old joke then. <laughs> Let me look at you again. Dear Joe. <laughs> Uh, oh, now don't be jealous, Amy. Oh, I'm not. Not in the least. 
Well, you've had him in Europe for three years. If you haven't kissed him in all that time, I'm going to show you how. Excuse me, Miss. Professor Bear, what are you doing here? Uh, I was afraid to have a chance to give your mother her present in the moment, so I come with them myself. You old darling. Here is the present. I go back now. Well, you'll do nothing of the sort. I want you to stay and meet my family. Ah, let's see if I can guess who they are by the descriptions you have so many times expounded. All right. <laughs> And, uh, you are the maid, Sister May? Oh, correct. Pleased to meet you, Professor. And your husband? Uh, quite right, my name. Ah, uh, is Brooke. He's an honor. You have been in your baby, yeah? Just returned. <laughs> 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 Tell me how you were brought. Uh, I'm not her brother. This is Mr. Lawrence. From all the kissing business I interrupt, I think he is a brother. I'm afraid that's all I'll ever be to Joe. Ah, to be a brother to such a wonderful girl is an honor. I put the twins to bed. Oh, and here's the wonderful mother I have dreamed of someday knowing. Professor Bear, mother. <laughs> oh, Professor, of course. What brings you up, I think? Oh, uh, that is Miss Josephine's own uh, mind secrets. Really? Mother? <laughs> Joe has told us. <laughs> Man. The friend and confidant of the greatest mind in America, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Professor Bear, father. Oh, well, I'm happy to meet you, Professor. So you're the young man who is of such uh, assistance to our show, huh? Oh, none to the assistance that she has given me. Uh, where did you say you put the twins, Daisy and Demi? In the nursery. Come on, Amy, let's go see them. Uh, be careful not to wake them. I'll see that they don't. What uh, is the name of the babies? Uh, it's Daisy and Demi. Is that right? Yes, Laurie is their foster father. He wrote to us from Europe asking us to name the baby Daisy and Demi. Uh, but why Demi? In the French, that Demi in the half. Are the twins a baby in the half or are they teeth? <laughs> <laughs> Laurie will explain that later. Uh, there won't be any later. What do you mean? I have delivered the present and I go back by the train. No, you don't. <laughs> no, no, Professor. You are staying right here and having dinner with us. Is this more to dinner stay too? Certainly. Not dinner way I go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you must remain. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson is coming to dine with us. Oh, no, that's another color board. <laughs> and I want you to stay. You must. That's fine. <laughs> On second stop, the better I go. I have delivered the birthday present and I am finished. Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bring me a birthday present? Oh, heaven's so uh, blunder, I have made with my forgiveness. <laughs> Excuse me, Miss A slip of the tongue, my dear. Yeah, more than a slip. Uh, almost a slide. <laughs> Mother, I forgot your present. Why are the professor who posted and he brought it? I misunderstand the word post. I think that you mean that I bring it post haste. Okay. <laughs> I suppose the day will come when you learn to leave your doors locked. Anything to come in this house without the least interference from this family. Well, how are you, dear? Let me wish you a happy birthday. Here is a shawl for you to remember me by. I want to see how it agrees with your aging complexion. <laughs> Joe, good to have you back. I've read everything you've ever written, and like wine, you've improved with age. This way, no one going to introduce me, or must I introduce myself? Hey, Aunt Marsh, this is Professor Bear. A charm to meet you. You all have spoken so often and so pleasantly of you that I knew it was you when you came in. <laughs> Well, Joe was always my favorite in this family. <laughs> I knew she had it in her to succeed. But I hadn't brought her to it when she was younger. You man, I like your looks. I've read several of the articles Joe gave me, and I agree with your viewpoint. But I want to know how, when, and where did you meet Joe? Uh, well, are you tell them, yo? <laughs> Well, the first day I was at the Kirk's, I saw a servant girl ascending the stairs carrying a heavy load of coal. 
From out of nowhere appeared the professor, and he took the load of coal and carried it for the girl. Why did you help her? Ah, oh, her young back was too small for such heaviness. Well, my second day, I was passing the professor's room, and by merest accident, my umbrella hit against his door. Oh, and there I was, with my dressing gown on, the big blue sock in the one hand and the darling needles in the other. Darling <laughs> socks is not a pleasant thing. Ah, but it keeps the feet warm. <laughs> Absolutely. A few nights later, he asked if he could read me The Death of Wallenstein. In the parlor, I hope. Uh, you get your hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told him I had written stories, I shared them with him. And I lambasted her stories and, uh, how you say, uh, trashy writing style. Good <laughs> for you, young man. Well, after his sensitive criticism, I forsook trashy writing, turned to better things, and whatever success is mine is the <coughs> Professor Bear. Welcome to this family, young man. You and I have made something of this girl. I hope to make more. Oh, did you say so? <laughs> <laughs> Going stargazing in the hills. I want him to see the hills in the full sunshine. Uh, uh, professor, wait, Professor, I have a view of the hills I'd like you to see. Come sit down. Those are not hills. Here is standing the waterfalls. Where? Take a look at me. Oh. It's Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls? What an issue. The professor isn't interested in Niagara Falls. Oh, yeah, the professor is interested in that. <laughs> why, why would you be interested in Niagara Falls, professor? Isn't that the place where everybody goes to get married? No, honeymoon would be, be perfect without seeing Niagara Falls. Yeah. I hope to go there someday soon. Alone? I hope not. Uh, <laughs> here's the view I wanted you to see. This is beautiful. Is that a church in the foreground? <laughs> Let me see. Oh, Father, it's the church we were married in. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't hurry, we won't see the hills in the proper light. I will run over to my house and get a book on the hills, Professor. We'll see the hills now in person. Come, Professor. Wait, Professor. Professor. I want to show you some pictures of the children when they were young. Professor, I can't see the children when they were young, Mother. Oh, I wish I was, and I'm interested in them. I'll be right back. Well, Professor, sit right down here. I want to read you some of Ralph Waldo Emerson's poetry. Father, the light is fading in the hills. It will take you at least an hour to read that. Dear, I read correctly, not slowly. Listen, there was an old man very rosy and fat, who continually wore a high beaver hat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was an old maid, very thin and prim, who cast amorous glances at him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But just a minute, my dear. Oh, excuse me, later we all laugh together. <laughs> I mean, a picture of you when she was little. Yes, here it is. Here she is when she was three. Oh, she hasn't changed much. <laughs> Let me see. Well, she's pretty now, but she was beautiful then. Well, I don't know her then, but she's beautiful too now. Thank you, Professor. Oh, here's Amy, and here's Meg. And uh, who is this angelic child? Mm. That's our Beth. Oh, you all tell me about her, how you all love and care for her, and the devotion she gives you right up to the end. Yes. Yeah. Right up to the end. Mother dear. Excuse me, please, Monsieur. I'm so sorry. It isn't your fault. Come with me, Professor. I want to show you the works we have on Emerson. And I want to read you the rest of this poem. Ha! 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 I can hear you laughing about it for weeks to come.
Mind your own, Joe. It's the first time I've been alone in hours. Did you want to be alone? Yes, with someone. Professor. Yes. My family seems to think that because he doesn't speak our language very well, they have to entertain him. Joe, I have a surprise for you. You're always full of them, Laurie. Joe, <clears throat> I am no longer a single man. <laughs> You've gone and gotten married. You are married, aren't you? Yes, but I never shall again. <laughs> Mercy on us, what dreadful thing will you do next? <laughs> a characteristic, but not necessarily a complimentary congratulation. Well, you come and tell me all about it. Come on, fess up, Lori. How wonderful it is to see you again, Joe. Lori, you haven't told me who you married. Well, can't you guess? Well, not <laughs> Amy. What an excellent guesser you are. My heartiest congratulations. So what do you think? Don't I look like a married man and a <clears throat> head of a family? <laughs> not a bit. You've grown bigger, but you're the same <laughs> Now, really, you ought to show me more respect. How can I? When the mere idea of you married and settled is so irresistibly oh. funny. Well, why didn't you write and tell me? Well, we wanted to surprise you. And you succeeded. Joe, there's something I want to tell you. And then we'll put it by forever. Amy has been so kind to me, but I never could stop loving you. And that love changed. You and Amy changed places in my heart. That's all. You see, it was meant to be. <laughs> and it would have come about naturally if I would have waited as you tried to. But I never could be patient. Yeah, I told you that once. I was a boy then. Headstrong and violent. You see, it took a hard lesson to teach me my mistake. For it was, Joe. And I knew that then. Upon my word. I was so tumbled in my mind at one time, I didn't know who I loved most. You were Amy. And then we got into our right places? Yes. And then I could honestly share my heart with both Sister Joe and wife Amy and love them both dearly. Oh, Lord. Will you believe it then and go back to the good old days when we first knew one another? Yes. But shouldn't we tell the others? Tell them what? Like you and Amy are married. A capital idea! <laughs> Bye! John! Matt, just a minute, then. I'm working on Sunday's sermon. What is it, Lori? We have something to tell you. Lori has something interesting to tell everyone. Everyone, I want you all to meet my wife. Ah! Oh, oh, isn't oh, she beautiful? Oh, <laughs> welcome to the family. Thank, Thank you, sir. Oh, oh, Thank this you. is wonderful. <laughs> You have never, ever looked more radiant or more beautiful. Now I understand. Marriage agrees with you, my dear. Well, look at the wonderful example she's had all of her life. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> Amy and I get along like angels. Yeah, who takes charge? I do. Oh, I better think she does. <laughs> by and by, we'll take turns. For marriage has one's rights and doubles one's duties. Oh, that ever I should live to see you a henpecked husband. Oh, no. Amy is much too well-bred for that. No, my wife and I love and respect one another much too much to ever tyrannize or quarrel. <laughs> Didn't I say that once? <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> yes, sir. My wife Amy and I. Excuse, please. Did you say this lady is your wife? Yes, Professor. My wife, Amy. Oh, my heartiest congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know it before. Oh, you make your tweet me your. <laughs> <laughs> he only told me moments ago. You see, Amy and I thought it would be the surprise of all surprises. Ah, uh, such surprises is either welcome or disaster. Mm -hmm. Quite right, Professor. Uh, personally, I like to inform people of my intentions. So is that why you decided to sort of uh, drop in on us this evening? Lori, <laughs> <laughs> our luggage is still outside. Let's go get it could that be so? A little premature, Professor. What did you bring, Amy? <laughs> so many fancy French things. Oh, let's go see, John. You'll love my new clothes. They're cute, lacy, and fluffy. Hey, what did you bring, Lori? <laughs> oh, loads and loads of things. Not cute, lacy, and fluffy, I hope. <laughs> let's go, Mom. 
Hey, you run along and look here. I'm going to stay here and entertain the professor. I think the professor would like a little younger company. Well, I don't call Mr. Mark so old. <laughs> but you've always enjoyed looking at the girls' dresses, dear. Oh, when did I? <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Especially if they're cute, lacy, and puppy. <laughs> Well, do you want to go see the dresses also? No. I have something to say to you. Well, won't you sit down? No, what I say, I say quickly. <laughs> Miss Gil, I'm going very far away. Where? To, to how you say, uh, Chili, Chili Mikadi Oyao. Chillicothe, Ohio. What are you going there for? To teach German. I have accepted a position at the university there. When do you expect to leave? Immediately. Oh, I shall miss you. Miss Yo, I have nothing but love to give you. For this reason, I, I come here to see if you could not care for me. Go on. <laughs> the moment. Yes, yes, the place, the moment. The magical moment when youth is bestowed upon the old. The beauty on the plain. Well on the floor. And gives human hearts a foretaste of heaven? Yeah. The beast my lines need you. Does that sound sentimental? Those are the sweetest words I've ever heard. But why didn't you say them before? I, I was not sure there was not someone else. Oh, there is no one for me but you. Uh, oh, we are the Why do suppose no one wants to read my book on the hills now? Sit right here. Oh, what is the meaning of this? It's an old family tradition. On our birthdays, we sit in this chair. Many years ago, when you were all very small, I made this crown for your mother. And I'm glad to see that it still pleases my little women. Ah, the queen of queens. Ah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Marnie. Happy birthday to you. at our performance this evening, especially over here, all this loud group. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue to play until May 6th, and so we ask you to please invite your extended family and friends to come to see us. Our next show will begin May 10th, which is called Time After Time. This is the 50s musical, which premiered here last year. Now it's brought back by popular demand. Now on your way out the door, please feel free to say hello to the cast, drive home safely, and please come back often. Good night. <laughs>